The German philosopher Ferdinand Ulrich is not yet very well known in either English or German speaking worlds of philosophy and theology, although all of you have showed up, so that's great. But I hope and think that that will soon change due to the importance, breadth, and depth of his work. If you've never before heard of Ulrich, perhaps the best touchstone to present to you is the Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar. Balthasar and Ulrich ended up being good friends, and they were also mutually influencing of each other's work. Balthasar dedicates one of his books, a volume of explorations in theology, to Ulrich, and he wrote the following about Ulrich's first book, Homo Abyssus, which is where Ulrich lays out the foundations of his metaphysics. Balthasar writes that Homo Abyssus has one great advantage over all of the other ontology. It stands in intimate contact with the mysteries of revelation, offers access to them, and yet never abandons the strictly philosophical domain. In this sense, it overcomes the baneful dualism between philosophy and theology, and it does so perhaps more successfully than ever before. This is no small compliment. I highlight these accolades from Balthazar not only to introduce Ulrich, but also to begin to set up a framework for ourselves in which to situate the thinker in our own minds. Fernand Ulrich is a Catholic philosopher. By this, I mean that he is a philosopher through and through, and that he takes the knowledge of revelation seriously. That is to say, Ulrich does not think revelation must be artificially bracketed in order to do philosophy. It's just the opposite. Revelation expands our vision and therefore our ability to think about the world well beyond anything we could hope to see under our own power, so to speak. Revelation is not a violation or an intrusion upon reason, but in fact, that which elevates and fulfills it. And so revelation must not be subtracted from our understanding of the world so that we might do some kind of so-called pure philosophy. Rather, if our philosophy is to be thorough and compelling, we must take revelation into account in our thinking of the world. I should add here that I don't think this stance at all controversial, even if it is often painted as such. Every philosopher, indeed every person, integrates what he understands to be ultimate into his thinking. Ulrich happens to be much more honest about his starting point than some other philosophers in the philosophical tradition, which I think is a point to his favor rather than to his detriment. Being a Catholic philosopher, however, does not mean that Ulrich spends his time regurgitating points from the tradition that have already been made, nor does it mean that he ghettoizes himself into thinking about specifically or only Catholic questions, whatever that could mean. When I say that Ulrich is Catholic, I mean it in the dual sense. He takes revelation into account when thinking about the world, but also that he thinks about everything. Ulrich's philosophy expands into questions about the nature of human being, freedom, language, atheism, childhood, and even fairy tales. The breadth of this thought can at times be dizzying, but it should also prompt us to ask why Ulrich feels free to write about such an array of topics and to treat them with such depth. Ulrich is a philosopher, yes, but he is first and foremost a metaphysician. Metaphysics, as Aristotle defines it, is the study of being itself, toti and anai, the what it is to be of a thing, meaning it is the study of the structures of reality, that which allows everything we see and encounter, and more than a few things we do not, to be. Metaphysics is named such because it is that which is above or beyond physics, the study of that which transcends but also undergirds our reality. If one thinks about the structure of reality, that which allows everything to be, then one will likely have something to say about everything. And when one dedicates some time to studying Ulrich, one sees that that is true. Ulrich's metaphysics, however, has a particular trajectory that he does not necessarily share with other philosophers. Ulrich's metaphysics is also always a meta-anthropology, or perhaps more specifically stated, the telos of Ulrich's metaphysics is meta-anthropology. What do I mean by meta-anthropology? Much the same as metaphysics, except with a particular eye toward human being, rather than being in general. What is the nature of specifically human being, and why does it seem to stand out amongst the rest of the world? 
the nature of freedom seems to play rather a large part in this question, and specifically man's nature as embodied freedom. Ulrich's understanding of metaphysics as tending toward and ultimately fulfilled and crowned by meta-anthropology shows us already that he understands man to be both fulfillment of and in some sense explanation for all of being. We must be careful here not to mistake this understanding for a superficial anthropocentrism. Ulrich does not think that all of reality exists to satisfy man's whims or something like that. Rather, he understands human being to be the apex of all created being. All of what being desires to be, if we can put it that way, and I think that we can, all of what being desires to be comes to fruition in human being. As such, man is the height of created being, but also its shepherd. And as its shepherd, this means that being is not just for man, so to speak, but that man is for being. Man is the fulfillment of created being, but this in turn means that being is man's task. I need, however, to back up a bit before going down that path. We're still orienting ourselves, which I must admit takes some time when it comes to Ulrich's thought. I can say with confidence, however, that taking the time to understand Ulrich's thought is worth it, even if it is at times arduous. But it is worth it because it is arduous. Metaphysics is always difficult because one can never stand outside of one's subject, which is being itself, and approach it stepwise. We can't wade little by little into metaphysics because we are always already in the deep end, swimming around in being, trying to figure out just what reality is and means. Metaphysics isn't really introduced to us, it is us, and then at some point, if we're lucky, we get to start thinking more directly about being. Ulrich recognizes this and wishes to convey exactly this in all of his writing. It's not actually that Ulrich throws us into the deep end without a life jacket, even if it feels that way when one starts to read him. It's that he's bringing our attention to the fact that this has always been our situation. When I say that Ulrich recognizes that we're swimming in the deep end already, what I mean is that Ulrich is always dealing with the whole at all times, though of course different dimensions of it at any given point. Trying to deal with different dimensions of reality while simultaneously keeping the whole in view is very difficult, but it is also very fruitful. And in Ulrich's case, it gives rise to a metaphysics rich and textured enough to say something true. And that is no small feat. So then, I have seemingly set a high bar for us to get over in order to begin any study of Ulrich or with Ulrich. My intention, however, is not to intimidate, but rather to entice. How exciting it is to study reality with someone who struggles and strains to see it in all of its wholeness and majesty. And despite everything I have just said, it is also true that Ulrich's metaphysics can be summed up in one small sentence, being his gift. The task, of course, is to unpack everything included therein. Being as gift is the intimate heart of the entirety of Ulrich's metaphysics. We could go so far as saying that being as gift is the gestalt of all of Ulrich's work. This insight gives all of his writing its shape, and it is that out of which everything else flows. Please note that when I say being as gift, I mean this both literally and as deeply as possible. To call being gift is for Ulrich not a mere metaphorical attribution, but a radical description of the nature of being itself. This means, of course, that we likely must deepen our understanding of gift, but it also means that if we pay attention to what we already know about what gift means, we will discover that we know rather a great deal about being already. To begin with, to say that being is gift already implies that there is both a giver and a receiver. This leads us to wonder who is whom here? Who is the giver of this gift and who is its receiver? The answer lies in the revelation of the act of creation. Or we could put it a different way. Ulrich's assertion that being his gift comes directly from his knowledge of the world as created. But to know being is created is not necessarily to know that it is gift. What leads, what leads Ulrich to this further conclusion? Once we know that the world is created, 
we are left in what seems to be a bind with regard to why God has created. To say that God must create, that it was necessary, cannot be correct, for this would violate God's freedom. On the other hand, to suppose that God created the world on a random whim doesn't really seem right either, since it would seem to violate God's being logos, that is, reason or truth itself. Ulrich thinks that being's nature as gift to be the most accurate explanation, so to speak, for why God creates. Let's think about why this might be the case. If we think about the nature of a true gift, we know that one never must give a gift. In fact, if one must give a gift, it's not a gift at all, but perhaps an exchange or some kind of coercion. Additionally, when one gives a gift, one should not expect anything in return because then that would be bribery. A true gift is freely given simply because one wants the other to have what one wants to give. It's not forced, it's free and it's given out of love. Though in gift giving, one cannot really expect anything in return, this does not mean that the giver doesn't care about the gift he's just given. If I give one of my favorite books to a friend and he uses it as a doorstop rather than reading it, I think I'd be understandably a little upset. Why? Why do I care about the way my friend uses or abuses or misuses the gift that I've given him, even when I've given it to him in freedom and I know for sure it's now his? Because as we all know, when we're excited to give someone a gift, I've thought about the gift, I've put effort and care into it, thought about the receiver and what he would like. In short, in a certain sense, I am in that gift, and that gift represents me. It is true that I was not forced to give it, and it is true that once I give it, it really belongs to my friend to do with whatever he wills. But what is not true is that I no longer care at all about the gift. I believe, along with Ulrich, that something similar is true about God and creation. Now, this sort of phenomenology of gift giving is not a complete explanation for why Ulrich thinks gift is the best way to understand being, but it does help us begin to understand why it is appropriate to call being gift. To emphasize, Ulrich does not use the word gift out of sentiment, but rather as the best way to describe the nature of being itself, which is why we can say that Ulrich's metaphysics is entirely informed by an understanding of the gift nature of being. Nor is Ulrich alone in this, as philosophers such as Kenneth Schmitz, John Milbank, and William Desmond have also landed on this term. I cannot here get into the history of this, but it seems to me that this convergence comes at least in part as a response to the 19th and 20th century philosophers who began to put a great deal about the world into question. A response to these kind of radical questions, including why does anything exist at all rather than nothing, requires an equally radical response which includes rethinking or deepening our understanding of the nature of being itself. And how interesting that the responses to these kinds of radical questions seem to keep coalescing around this theme of gift. It is of course true that my giving a book to my friend and God creating are more dissimilar than they are similar. And so our understanding of being as gift must go well beyond what I have just described. To note one very large difference immediately, my friend already exists when I give him the book. For that matter, so does the book. Creation then is not like any other gift because the gift is in the first place existence itself. To put it another way, the receiver is given to himself in the act of creation. We tend to think of a gift as a thing, right? A something passed between giver and receiver. But this is not the case in creation. The giver always is, but the receiver is not until the giver creates him. This may be somewhat difficult for us to imagine, but creation ex nihilo, that is out of nothing, means that until God creates, another that is not God does not yet exist. So already we know that thinking the gift nature of being requires us to go beyond our quotidian understanding of gift. We can ask then what it could mean that being is a gift when there is no receiver in the first place. As I said above, we can affirm that existence is the gift. That is to say, 
the gift of being at all. This is true, but with Ulrich's help, I'd like to push a bit further. One of the most striking features of Ulrich's metaphysics is that he affirms over and over again in his work that being is nothing. The sign is nix. Now, I realize I've just spent the past 15 minutes or so explaining why we can and should think of being as gift. And now I introduce the fact that Ulrich also affirms that being is nothing. And thus the question should of course be, is how are these two statements reconcilable? But I think they are not only reconcilable, but intrinsic to each other. Being can only be understood radically as gift if it is also understood as nothing. In asserting that being is nothing, one might wonder if Ulrich is taking his cues from Heidegger, who famously writes about the nothing, das nichts. I can assure you this is not the case. Although it would be silly to say that Ulrich is not at all influenced by Heidegger. We all are whether we recognize it or not, and Ulrich certainly does recognize it. It is also the case that Ulrich is inspired by Heidegger in the sense of being pushed to respond to the radical questions about being and metaphysics with which Heidegger presents us. But when Ulrich writes that being is nothing, he is not in fact following Heidegger, but rather another, and I think better, philosopher, Thomas Aquinas. In fact, surveying the whole of Ulrich's work, it becomes clear very quickly that the angelic doctor is the touchstone and inspiration for Ulrich's entire metaphysical framework. Of course, Ulrich is not slavishly repeating Thomas's words, and I doubt the great saint would ever want anyone to do such a thing. Rather, his understanding of Thomas's metaphysics is so deep and so from within, as it were, that Ulrich returns to Thomas and his work over and over again in order to help him think about God being the world and how they all relate. Our first question should then be what in Thomas's corpus Ulrich thinks gives him license to say repeatedly that being is nothing. Thomas writes the following in De Potentia Dei, question one, article one. Ipsum esse as completum et simplex sed non subsistence. Being itself is complete and simple, yet non-subsistent. This is not an outlier in Thomas's corpus. There are many other quotes in the Summa and other works that echo it. But lucky for us, he puts it most succinctly in De Potentia. Being is complete and simple, yet non-subsistent. Let's try to unpack this briefly. And I do mean briefly, since an argument could be made that all 526 pages of Homo Abyssus is unpacking just this statement from Thomas Aquinas. So according to Thomas, essay is what binds us all together. It is that which allows anything, everything to be or exist at all. Etienne Gelson calls it the act of existence, which I think helps us start to imagine what's going on here. Essay is often translated as being, and this is absolutely appropriate, but also at times hinders our imagination since we often forget the verbal quality of gerunds. Think of the word thinking. We can treat it as a noun, right? That man has some thinking to do, but we can also use it as something that is currently happening. I am thinking, as in I am in the process of having thoughts. In this latter sentence, I am thinking, thinking represents something I am currently doing. So too with being. Each and everything is not simply passively there, so to speak, but rather it is in the process of existing, of being, right? And so another way to translate essay is to be, as in essay is the to be of things. Thomas describes essay as complete and simple. And in other places, he refers to essay as the act of all actualities and the perfection of all perfections. By this, he means that essay is that which allows everything else to exist or to be at all. Metaphysically, the act of existence is what allows all of us and indeed all of creation to be. This is what I mean when I say being itself, an actuality which allows all other actualities to be. When Thomas writes that essay is complete and simple, then he points out that essay is not broken up with each creature having its own little part so that that each creature might exist or act for itself. No, essay, the to be of all things, 
is created perfect infinite actuality in which creatures participate. The act of creation could then be described as God's bestowing or giving esse creatum, that is created esse. Everything else we know in this world, the diversity of creation, the history of the world, the complexity of our very selves, is given when created essay is given. And this is what Thomas means when he refers to essay as complete and simple. Being itself is given to the world, or perhaps more accurately, the world comes to be when being itself or because being itself is given. You may have noticed in the previous paragraph, I introduced a qualifier when speaking about essay that is created. This helps us understand why Thomas describes essay as complete and simple, yet non-subsistent. For there is essay being that is complete and simple and subsistent. And this is what we call God. God is ipsum esse subsistence, subsistent being itself. God has no creator. He does not exist by anyone or anything else's power. Creation or created being is ipsum esse non subsistence. Esse creatum is still being itself, and as such, it is complete and simple and perfect but it does not subsist under its own power or stand on its own, as it were. Now, there are any number of paths we could follow with this as our starting point, and I'm pretty sure Ulrich follows all of them. But we are trying to understand first why Ulrich says that being is nothing, and why that connects and is even intrinsic to his understanding of being as gift. When Ulrich states that being is nothing, he is simply restating Thomas's affirmation of created essay as non-subsistent. To say that essay is non-subsistent is to assert that essay is not a thing in itself. Essay is not a thing that subsists. Essay is rather the actuality that allows all other things to subsist. That is, to be themselves and exist under their own power. This is why Ulrich repeatedly states that Dasein ist nichts. He's trying to remind us, and himself, I think, that being is not a thing. We might ask why it is important to remind ourselves continually that being is nothing. Well, first of all, because we are materially bound creatures, it's difficult not to imagine that what has existence isn't a thing, that what has actuality or is actuality isn't a thing. In a certain sense, things are all we know and language starts to fail us at the far reaches of our knowledge. But more importantly, we must remind ourselves that being is nothing because thinking being as a something is actually a temptation. And Ulrich uses this language of temptation purposely because it has to do with our understanding of God. Thomas emphasizes created being's non-subsistence in order to demonstrate its difference from subsistent being, that is, God. In fact, the act of creation could be, could be said to be God's creating being. That is to say, as I did earlier, that all of creation has its existence in and through this act of creating being. And this is one of the many reasons to keep reminding ourselves that created being is nothing in itself. It only is, it only subsists in and through creatures. If esse creatum subsisted in itself, then there would be this third thing, so to speak, between God and creation, which would inevitably end up in competition with both God and creation. Thomas writes that God creates in and through ipsum esse. Ulrich is adamant, as is Thomas, I think, that this does not mean esse is a mediator between God and creation. Rather, Ulrich writes, created essay is pure mediation. Being is not a third thing between God and creation, but the pure mediation of existence to creatures themselves, so that they may be themselves, that is, so that they might subsist. The difference may seem subtle or even nonsensical at first, but if we think the counterfactual through, it might help us to see what's at stake here. If created being were a thing, right, like a subsistent actuality, 
then it could not also be infinite, as Thomas affirms esse creatum is, because there's only one infinite subsistent actuality, which is God. Ulrich writes that when we think of being as subsistent, we give pseudo subsistence, right? Like a weird kind of subsistence. We give pseudo subsistence to being in thought. And this pseudo subsistent being would not be pure mediation of existence to creatures. Rather, pseudo subsistent being would try, as all subsistent beings do, to keep itself in subsistence, right? That is to say, it wouldn't mediate being at all, right? It would just try to keep it for itself. In this sense, a pseudo subsistent, pseudo infinite being is actually in competition with creation rather than that which allows creation and all creatures to be. Additionally, because this pseudo subsistent being, so to speak, looks like God, that is, is supposedly infinite actuality that is also subsistent, it then also becomes in competition with really subsistent actuality, which is God himself. Perhaps worst of all, this temptation, right, this temptation to give being a kind of pseudo subsistence places something between God and his creation, right, this third thing that I, I was calling it before, such that God is not involved in his creation in the way that Christians know he must be if he indeed has created ex nihilo. There is nothing between God and his creation. God directly gives being, right, the act of existence when he creates. We could say that in the act of creation, God gives creation to itself, and he does so through essay. I said earlier that beings being nothing is not just connected, but intrinsic to beings being gift. Perhaps we can see this a little more clearly now. Beings nothingness, that is the fact that being is not a thing subsisting in itself, is precisely what allows it to be given away to subsistent creatures such that they can exist. Ulrich writes that being, quote, holds nothing back for itself. And because in truth, being has no self, right? Because it's not a thing, being's very nature all the way down, so to speak, is simply to be given to another. The very reality and nature of being itself is to allow another to be. And no one other than the creator himself originally gives being our relationship to him is not negotiated by some third that's between God and creation. So our relationship to God is not mediated by, or is not negotiated by a third, but rather in creation, we know that God himself wanted creation, us, right, but all of creation to be, but he also wants us to be ourselves, to subsist under our own power, being is nothing, then, precisely because God wanted to give us the gift of being himself. Being's nature is gift because its source is the giver who wishes to give his creatures everything. So just one coda. Returning to my short phenomenology of gift giving, I mentioned that the giver cares about how the receiver receives the gift. If my friend uses the book I gave him as a doorstop, I'll probably at least be annoyed, right, if not somewhat hurt. And even though I've given the gift freely, that is, I haven't given it with the expectation of a gift in return, or even, I haven't even given it with, like, the expectation that my friend will, like, read the book immediately. It's still true that the gift has a certain logic to it. In this case, the logic, since it's a book, is that it is to be read and not used as a doorstop. And so giving the gift out of love doesn't mean I don't care about it. It means that I'm passing the logic of the gift onto the receiver within the gift itself. And this means that the gift carries within itself a kind of task, in this case, to read the book. The main German word for gift is gabe, 
Okay. And Ulrich uses this often to describe the nature of being. But there is a related word he uses just as often, Aufgabe, which we would normally translate as task. Ulrich plays on this dual sense of Aufgabe often. Being is gift, yes, but because it is a gift, it is also a task for man. I mentioned this earlier, though we can say that all of creation is the recipient of the gift of being, it is also true that man is the only receiver of the gift that recognizes that he is just that, right, a receiver. And because of this, the reception of the gift of being comes with the task of receiving it well. This is why metaphysics leads to meta-anthropology for Ulrich. The subtitle for Ulrich's first work, Homo Abyssus, is Das Wagnis der Seinsvertrage, which, which has been translated into English as the drama of the question of being. But there's another way to translate this word Wagnis, which I actually prefer, and that's risk. So then it would be the risk of the question of being. Ulrich recognizes that just as the giving of a gift is always a risk, because the giver is never sure how or if the receiver will receive it, right, or receive it well or receive it poorly. So just as the giving of the gift is always a risk, so too is the task of receiving the gift. Asking the question of being and doing the work of continuing its logic is always a risk because the very nature of reality and our own being, right, human being, is at stake. But according to Ulrich, it is a risk we take simply by being alive. And so we might as well embrace it as radically as possible. Thank you.